Until we have consistency in our mental approach on the golf course, players won't be able to discern, is it a technical breakdown or is this really a mental breakdown? Mm. And so when a lot of my players will come back and say, John, my process numbers were really good and I'm doing things the way I should be doing out there, but things aren't clicking. I usually mm -hmm. say, hey, go talk to your swing instructor. Yeah. Because now we know this player is putting themselves into a position mentally to at least on that focus band be as relaxed as they could in competition. Mm -hmm. So we should be getting the better aspects of the motor program. It doesn't mean it's going to be perfect, but we should still be seeing quality shots. If, if there are quality shots aren't happening with the right mental approach, we definitely can discern right away that there's a technical error. All right, John. Well, thanks again for being a guest back on Wicked Smart Golf Part 2 today. Yeah, thanks for having me back. I'm really excited. And thank you for the extra 45 minutes with me going through my uh, mental golf life crisis. So much appreciated there. What you're doing, uh, not only with golf, is, is helping people in life too. So thanks again for uh, helping it out because the mind really does play such a big role in, in this crazy game. Can you give just a Cliff Notes version of what is mental golf type? I know Cliff Notes are tough, but... Yeah, Cliff Notes version is tough, but in, in essence, um, peak performance and mental performance specifically is not one size fits all. It's very much unique to the individual. And what mental golf type has done is we looked at what universally everybody needs to do to be performing at their best, which is getting into alpha brain waves or in a relaxed state of mind. And we also learned what stops everybody's performance, which is stress. Now what mental golf type does is it starts getting into the nuances or those individual elements of what you do well that causes your mind to relax and also what's going to predictably create stress in you. Now stress is the biggest killer of performance in the game of golf because when you get stress, cortisol, adrenaline, norepinephrine start getting released in the body, elevate your heart rate which will impair motor functioning and most especially the cortisol release in your own in your brain is holding back on that motor cortex that's the part of your brain responsible for your golf swing, your movement, your motor programs. And when we're experiencing mental stress, this is clamping down. So mental golf type determines which of the 16 different mental golf types or hard wirings you could have. It teaches you your natural strengths, what you're going to be predictably cause you stress and performance breakdowns and how to shift out of that. Um, so it's really exciting. You can go on and take the free assessment right now for the program if you want. Uh, it's at mentalgolftype.com, and that way you can get your results for free and, and see where you fit in. Yeah, man, it, it's had a huge impact on my game. A lot of people I've talked with have just, like, never even thought about how this stuff can play in. And one thing I didn't ask you about last time was what the testing process was like, like when you were figuring all this out years ago, because you talk about, uh, I don't know if it's maybe inside the coaching training that I went through, or maybe it is a mental golf type about the focus band technology and, and how that monitors what our brain is doing uh, for certain tasks. So can you just kind of like maybe talk about, for example, like introvert versus extrovert. We always use that one uh, as a pretty easy one. So when some when you're like testing, like, okay, extroverts, we find that they need to talk more they need to be projecting outward doing all the things like that you have someone wearing a focus band then that is an extrovert and basically looking at like what their brain waves are going to look like when they're doing the right things versus the wrong things is that kind of how the testing went into it well a lot of testing went into it uh, initially it was a lot of interviewing self-reporting just kind of diving into the whole personality aspect and then from there the focus band for people who don't know uh, it's not quite as sophisticated as an EEG, so like you wouldn't be able to produce like a real readout to show like definitively you're in alpha waves, but it's showing through biofeedback. When your brain is relaxing, your vision and things is softening up and your mind's getting into that ideal focus. And when you're relaxing like that, you're going to hear a chime going off that gives you some auditory feedback and some visual feedback. Um, whenever your brain is overactive or you're starting to get stressed, you're employing too many beta rhythms, let's say, this, the band goes red and the tone stops. And so essentially it's showing when there's overactivity and when the mind is becoming a lot more peaceful and a lot more relaxed. There's some other really cool biofeedback stuff too you can do when I was like learning meditation and self-hypnosis and things. I had one that you could put your fingers into and you had a movie playing. It was like waves or you had a couple things. And as long as you were relaxed, the movie played. Huh. And the moment you you kind of elevated your state or you spiked your heart rate or whatever, it would pause and it would stay frozen until you started relaxing again. 
And it was a really wonderful way to at least get feedback to know like, yeah, I'm starting to get into these states. And then you start connecting the way you're feeling and things, and it gets a lot more achievable on your own in your own way. And so the focus band is a really helpful tool. So it teaches breathing, for one, if you're effective with using your breath. And that's where a lot of people are using that. And it also trains you that real focus is a lot softer and a lot less intense. I use the word soft because I don't really know how else to describe it, but it's a lot less intense than what most people do. We found that, like, let's say I was staring, like, at a boxing opponent. And I'm staring them down, and we're intensely staring at our golf ball. We found that on that focus band, it just immediately would go red. Mm -hmm. And it isn't until they have a, a measure called quiet eye, where the eyes start softening and the gaze softens till you start going into those peak chimes, which is like the, the really upper echelon of relaxing your mind. So it gave us a nice measuring tool and it gave us a nice way to determine if a person is what we're training them to do is relaxing them, causing them to be at peace or whether it's creating overactivity or even stress. So either way, we found that overactivity or stress, I think those could almost be lumped under the same umbrella, will create performance struggle. One of our big classic ones that was the big challenge point in MGT was when we started learning that people would do better being player side. Mm -hmm. And here I spent 10 years of my life working on the subconscious, bringing in more of that intuitive element, again, thinking everybody needed to do things that way and also looking at a lot of the books that are framed from an intuitive perspective. I just had a hard time once we started figuring out player size like there's just no you know this is like really counter what a lot of people say. So we put the focus band on and players were there at address and we were eliminating the target. Their brains going relaxed. Right. Hey, can you can you before you get into that can you just explain the difference between player side and, and target side cuz this is one of the most profound things for me that I was completely butchering and going against my mental golf type. Through our, our researching and diving in with lots of players and, and understanding things, we realized that there is a focus line at the address position. Uh, the commitment line is a kind of a familiar thing that divides. Uh, Lynn and Pia from Vision 54 have think box, play box. We have our red and yellow zones, but it's dividing our thinking to performing aspects. Um, the focus line when you're at address, if you're a right-handed player, you could imagine like an alignment rod separating the player side of the line where you are from the target side of the line. And believe it or not, based on your perception style and what's dominant in your perception style will determine which side of the line you could be on. Now, the two styles that we have, and this is where, again, we don't really, mental golf type helps to make the conversation a lot more um, informative, uh, more specific and understandable, because when you just talk focus, that's such a broad concept that it's really hard for people to know what's correct and what isn't. And what we've never been taught is you have a right and a left hand, essentially, in your mind with the way you focus. You can have, we have a sensing aspect and we have an intuitive aspect. Sensing aspect is very linear, likes to look at facts, details, all the little pieces. If you looked at the fMRI, the brain's chopping it down into the little parts and pieces and all the chunks. That's the sensing side. Believe it or not, more of the world is on a sensing side dominant, which may be more left hemisphere, if you will. But it's, it's looking at facts, details, traditional things, and then we have intuition. And intuition is the other aspect of our mind that takes the little parts and pieces and connects it into the whole. So it thinks that aspect is more focused on big picture, concepts, theories, how things interconnect and interplay. Intuitives tend to be a lot more general in the way that they talk. Uh, they're more innovative. They like to ponder the question, what if? Sensors like, what is fact? And so there are two really opposed types of ways we could be focusing. Um, and so what the focus line determines is, is if you're a sensor, you're going to be doing a lot better if the majority of your focus is staying more on the player side, something you're in control of. And by player side, you mean looking more at the golf ball versus looking It could be at more the at the golf or... ball, but player side, target side is more of than where we're physically looking per se. It's more about the mentality and mm -hmm. where our mindset's going. But certainly if you're a sensor, engaging the ball with your eyes more than the target will actually help you to stay in your dominant space more. Um, if you're an intuitive, we would want the eyes engaging the target more or getting more into the end goal. So... When we started putting the focus band on players, we could see that there was a clear distinction with 
which side of the line they were focusing on and the level of relaxation and how quickly they could get into those states. Um, I have a cool example. Maybe I can try to send it out to you. It's with an ESFJ. We're at a really demanding tee shot at Timiquan back in, in Florida when I was down there. And he is completely player side dominant. I think he peaks at the target for a half second. Mm -hmm. And during the whole process, that half second was the only time, the only time that the chime stopped. Wow. But here, the, I was reading the books, and they say, well, a player can't be into their body really feeling emotion or having a concrete thing to do. When I put it into that feeler, I said, I want you to feel your body, and I want you to feel the, the way you're working that job you've assigned. It's lighting up green. you know. And, and when you really look at the tour players, they're not responding like the books in, in, in the psychology books. They're not all engaging the target. If you really evaluate Tiger's routine, you're going to see in his eight seconds, his predictable eight seconds, he maybe looks at that target for a half second. If you pay really close attention, his eyes are going only to his intermediate spot and staying in his locus control player side. Xander Shoffley, watch them. They're not staring at the target and attempting to respond. Now, an intuitive player will respond better that way. They're going to be much more relaxed, staring out at the target, and allowing their intuition to connect the dots. Intuitives oftentimes will hit the shot and they say, well, how did you do that, Michael? And they say, well, I don't even know. I just kind of saw and I did it. And that's that intuitive, having that end goal being a lot more target driven. Interesting enough, stress is predictable. If you're an intuitive, you're going to get bogged down on the player side of the line when you're stressed, meaning caught up too much in your setup, your ball position, all the little details, focusing too much on your technique or the how to. And during that time, what you're doing is you're employing the wrong mental function, creates more work, more activity, focus bands red. What are we forgetting about? the rest of the equation for a good shot. And then it rarely works out. And as long as we're staying in that, we continue to struggle. Why? It isn't because your swing's bad. It's because that's creating stress in your brain and that mental stress, which has been hidden for a lot of players, is impairing your motor cortex and now the movement is being altered. That's why when we release it and we go, oh, I'm playing horrible, and then the intuitive starts looking at the target again, say, I'm just going to smack it out there, and then suddenly the swing comes right back because the stress is now relinquished. But because we've never really had really specific ways of talking about focus, this has kind of flown under the radar for many years. And vice versa, the sensors, what they're going to do at that focus line is rather than being into the details of their good setup, into some concrete little task to do. Now, I'm not talking about having overwhelming swing thoughts. Two thoughts or ideas are always too many. It's just a simple concrete thing to have as the focus, same as like I could have as the target. For a sensor, that gives them a feeling of control. They like concrete tasks, simple things that they know when I do this, that's going to happen. So is, and, is a good example of that like Justin Thomas with his kind of takeaway where he checks it like it's like almost like a P2 position where he's like before he in part of his routine he like checks that that's his like one checkpoint. That's his concrete task. Hey, mm -hmm. I know if I get here, everything else is going to be good. So we teach the sensors like, hey, one plus one always equals two. It doesn't matter where you're at in the world. Good aim or alignment plus for JT P2 equals desired result mm -hmm. and they just need to keep their focus on the one plus one Intuitive. So that, was the that was the problem with me though is that i was like oh i love jt you know he's one of my favorite players i want to swing like him i want to have his swagger his confidence and i before mental golf type adopted that and because it also was a move that all my coaches and i were working on i constantly get it inside and then i'd come over the top so it was trying to get it more out to in kind of doing that loop so I incorporated that part of it, but that is exact opposite for my personality type. And so I think that might have helped a little, but I think it might have also stressed me out more because it also led to taking longer time over the uh, golf ball and the routine, more uh, player side versus target side. And so I think that's one of the things I always try and tell people like on the podcast or uh, students, like you just have to be careful about who you're following. Because if you're following, like I'm an extrovert, but if I try and act like Tiger, who's an introvert, we're going to have some issues. Right, and I think understanding your personality type or your MGT, it helps to elevate appreciation because even though it might not be something ideal for you, you can appreciate they're using their gifts and that's why mm -hmm. Tiger is doing so well because these top performers have figured themselves out somehow with really good instructors or being very insightful. But 
Tiger and Phil, total different personalities, yet highly successful. Which one do you pick, right? Um, it's more about understanding what you're going to do, and then you can start looking at and hearing people that will model mm -hmm. more of what your style is. But yeah, 100%. And for all the intuitives out there, like there are swing things you have to work on. Okay, yeah. so we have to learn how to bridge that gap. So generally speaking, we do like a 555 drill. So if you're working on that takeaway, which might be a necessary component for your skill and, and to elevate your overall performance, you'd work on that completely mechanical, no target, five balls, 10 balls, full concentration on just being mechanical and learning to move. Then for an intuitive, if you got to think of your swing out on the golf course and we're kind of in that in between and we're working on some things, it's more beneficial to be thinking of it on the course in the second phase, which would be more motion. So now that you're feeling P2, what does it feel like when you're connecting it to the complete motion? And that's why intuitives can do well with concepts like rhythm or tempo because they're not micromanaging a piece. So the next phase would be connected into the motion and, and really still trying to feel that coming into play. And then your last five balls start connecting to the target, videotape your swing, and give yourself permission to engage the target, make free swings. Then use your videotape as a way to go back and get feedback. Now you can look at it. You've given yourself genuine freedom to make a move, and now you can see what you're retaining. And then you can look there and go, wow, I'm actually P2 looks really good. Well, keep staying in that performance mode, engaging the target will give you a lot of confidence. If it's not, you can go and recycle back through that as a way to start bridging that gap from technical into more of a performance style. And that's a big jump sometimes for intuitives because we're inundated with a sensing kind of how to in golf instruction. Mm. And so we have to use those tools to bridge that gap. That's a perfect segue because uh, that's something that a lot of people ask me as a as a writer and, and someone that's just tested out every training aid out there. People are like, should I use training aids? Should I not use training aids? And I've started to realize that, I, like, like you said, intuitives, I know it's about 25% of the population, might not be able to find them as helpful maybe as sensors or how do you, I mean, like should all types of players use them or should you use them sparingly? Like what are your thoughts? Because the training aid world is just such a big industry after going to the PGA show. I mean, that's like half the booths are, you know, the next thing to fix your swing and there's something always coming out because we're all addicts for this game. So should players use training aids? Uh, yeah, I think training aids are fine for all players. Um, what I always ask my players to do is, as they're working that training aid, what type of feedback or is what is that training aid giving to you, right? And then working to bridge out of that station, per se, and bring that same feedback or same quality when we're stepping away from, from it, uh, like for like a right online putting. You ask, what's, what are you getting from that? And then once you're starting to get that feel, start to transition. And if you're starting to disconnect from that, then you go back into that training aid. And I, I do think that's sometimes a necessary thing. I just wouldn't get so um, dependent on a training aid that we're not taking out of that station and trying to provide the same thing. I think there, there still needs to be that balance. But if you're an yeah. intuitive, be cautious about setting up a huge swing station and spending two hours on the range just working on micromanaging parts and pieces it will be a pretty stressful day and um you have to at least if you're working with that step out of those aids and and try to be doing it on your own as best you can uh, you know what when, when i think when i see like the tin cup at that point some of that to me it feels more like stress but yeah, and that's most why of the it's time like, it's you, just that search. To, yeah, that's why you need to like know your personality type though, even for practice, you know, because there's, I mean, there's like a whole section of my book about common practice mistakes, but this was even before I knew about MGT. And it's like, a lot of times you might just be practicing against the way you're wired and, and intentionally causing stress while you're practicing and not really, and you're just kind of there versus actually improving. Well, this, this brings up a big point and I don't always talk about this, but if you don't know your mental golf type, let's say, and have your shot process aligned. So one of the reasons we knew when we were chatting why we was a mental glitch was because the things weren't lining in your shot process. And we know predictably that you in that last tournament weren't putting yourself in the position to really bring out your best. That's a mental challenge. There ain't no run into the range that's going to fix the swing challenges you were experiencing there. Why was the swing breaking down? It wasn't because of faulty mechanics. 
You've probably seen faulty mechanics, but those surface because of the mental stress. Until we have consistency in our mental approach on the golf course, players won't be able to discern, is it a technical breakdown or is this really a mental breakdown? Mm. And so when a lot of my players will come back and say, John, my process numbers were really good and I'm doing things the way I should be doing out there, but things aren't clicking. I usually mm -hmm. say, hey, go talk to your swing instructor. Yeah. Because now we know this player is putting themselves into a position mentally to at least on that focus band be as relaxed as they could in competition. Mm -hmm. So we should be getting the better aspects of the motor program. It doesn't mean it's going to be perfect, but we should still be seeing quality shots. If, if there are quality shots aren't happening with the right mental approach, we definitely can discern right away that there's a technical error. But because we see technical errors because of the stress, so many players are making the assumption it's my swing still. Go practice more on my swing, my swing, my swing. But oftentimes it's usually a stress issue for a vast majority of the complications on a golf course, performance wise. It doesn't mean that we're neglecting performance or training or practice or working on our technique because that's going to be a big determiner of what your overall scoring handicap will be and your potential. Uh, Julia uh, Sergis, one of our coaches, I think she really nailed it. I, I agree 99%. I do agree with the right mental approach because we've seen it with so many players that you can reduce your scoring handicap, but it's, it's still going to take some work. However, if you really want to reduce your scoring handicap, you do have to put in work on your golf swing. You have to have the technical skill sets to be able to perform at that level and on those courses that are that demanding. Where your mental performance is, is within that handicap, though, she says you have a 10-shot a scoring variance or like a 10-shot scoring window. So let's just use easy numbers. Let's say you're averaging 80. That means anytime you're going to potentially play, you have really a scoring window of about 75 to an 85, plus or minus, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, so five. If, you're, right. if your mental approach is in the right place, even if the swing isn't clicking, you're going to find yourself on that lower end of that scoring variance. We're bringing that consistency in there. But most players are overlooking the subtle aspects of stress that are actually breaking their swing down. And this isn't just for tour pros. Amateurs and average golfers stand to benefit more from learning the mental performance too because it's going to get more out of their best and they have a, a bigger separator that it makes in their competition. But this, your mind is influencing every shot you take every day of the week, all the time. It can never be separated. So we have to make that constant so that we can discern what to address. Now, a player had a, a rough qualifier. I got a text the other day. His process numbers were well below what our threshold is. Well, that's mental. We're going to work on that. Mm -hmm. Before he was clicking at a high number, he had to adjust some of the swing. But this is how we can figure out what to go practice, what needs to be worked on, and so we can actually make real strides that we see performance benefits. So if you're striping it on the range, can't miss, and then you go out to the golf course and can't hit anything, that's most likely a mental issue. That's just It's a stress true. issue. That's, that's a stress, stress issue. issue. There, yeah. is, there is either where our focus is that's creating stress, we're having unnecessary consequences or threats that we're creating, and that's going to take us into using our inferior functions of mind. And oftentimes it's just players just don't know. Mm -hmm. So you hit it great, and they go and out, and they try go to back to the range, right, to try right. and fix it there. But then most of the time, the stress goes and go, "Wow, I'm hitting it great." Yep. Well, maybe I need another lesson, and and it just and that's where the head scratching goes. Mm -hmm. But what I hope to help my players with is one to become their own coach, and then two to be able to discern where my performance breakdowns technical or were they mental. And our goal is is to strive to have like real performance errors. We were putting ourselves in the place to succeed. We we're making the right decisions, but sometimes, you know, you can't make every jump shot <laughs> or mm -hmm. make every shot in any sport, but we're staying competitive and that that's a good place to be. So should players read sports psychology books or is it something where it's like kind of hit or miss? Because like you said, if the uh, author might be different or have different views than their personality type, could that actually hurt them? I think anytime you're exposing yourself to new information is good. What mental golf type though, even if you just take the free assessment, what that'll help you to start discerning is what's relevant for me and what might be detrimental. And rather than throwing rice at the wall in your game, you could streamline just by understanding the way you focus. Mm -hmm. And as you're reading it, you say, well, 
I could appreciate that, but that might not really align with me or, wow, that's perfect for me. So I think the prerequisite, even before diving into some of those books, would be one, learn more about yourself. So you have a better understanding of you. And now that you can know what's good and what to just kind of appreciate as a golf fan or someone who is interested in the topic. Um, a lot of the books, though, if you really think about it, you're not getting that psychologist is real work that he is putting in or she is putting in with their players. I mean, the things in the book that oftentimes they're spending hours with their players, they are getting to know them, they're having conversations. So it isn't a generalized approach that any of those top performers are getting, they're getting a very personalized and individual efforts to help them maximize their skill sets. Mm -hmm. Not many players can afford like a $20,000 visit from Rotella. You know, that's that's an expensive right. weekend. <laughs> yeah. But what we have done is, is we've helped to give you the same personalized approach within a system that you can reference forever, where for a cost of a lesson, you could have a coach that's going to speak your language all the time. And being armed with that understanding of yourself gives you a better understanding. Again, what's good for me? What isn't for me? And I think that is our biggest discernment factor. And also, some of those older books weren't being talked about. The, the theories are out there, but again, it's for their best player. There's mm -hmm. 16 different types. You may or may not be aligned. And also, some of the measuring devices. Now, more of the modern coaches have the measuring devices. We're coming out with things and validating and verifying where these are. And so, I don't think you could ever go wrong, but I would caution everybody, know yourself first. Mm -hmm. And then you'll find stuff that really works for you. And uh, yeah, you don't know I, why. I think that's so good because, I mean, I'm just a consumer of information, obviously, as a golf writer and just someone that always wants to reach potential. I mean, I just think how many times I read aim small, miss small, aim small, miss small, you know, and I would try that and it just wouldn't really work. And then I learned my personality type and was like, oh, that goes exactly away from it. And then I'm stressed out over the ball. It's just like little things like that. So, and that's a good point too, because you talked about like Dr. Bob Rotella, you know, everyone knows him, obviously Rory, I think flew him in for the masters that didn't work out great, missed the cut. But he's not telling the same thing to Rory versus another player. Like he said, he knows those individuals and gives them an individualized approach. And that's what mental golf type is, is that it's tapping into your unique personality. Now, I don't know Dr. Rotella, so these are obviously assumptions, right? But I would assume that it would be more tailored to that person mm -hmm. and also getting the feedback from the individual. It's tough to get that from a book. And yeah. again, just as a caution is, the old model is, is it's working for one, it could work for all, but now we're starting to understand that, yes, universally, we're all trying to achieve the same goal, but we're going to all have a little bit slightly different route to get there. Mm -hmm. um, and that's where understanding this in, in the core of where you're at wiring wise and what your strengths are, it's just super, super helpful in discerning. Mm -hmm. We talk a lot about full swing stuff, and that's really all the golf world seems to always be focused on, training aids, everything about the full swing. So that's why I love mental golf type. Obviously, you focus on, on that side of things. But how does that incorporate into the short game, too? Because I feel like that's a, a whole other area where people may not have the same routines. They might have different routines, things like that. So how does mental golf type affect your short game? Well, from your general focus standpoints and decision-making, it will all apply the same as full shot. Um, sometimes with my players, what I do differently, at least with their routine set, like the way the routine is, is in short game or I should say any shot that you would have a dispersion that you're trying to control long or short. I tend to have my players do their rehearsals next to the ball mm -hmm. so that they can maintain that feel, that thought in their mind and step right in and just kind of recapture that. So for mm -hmm. the intuitive, they'd step in after they start feeling that wedge get the eyes up on the target, come back and just match it for the S. It'd be a little bit different. It'd be a little bit more player side and into, you know, like Justin Rose, a great example. He talks about his little clock system. Austin mm -hmm. has a clock system. He's an ISTJ. They're working that. So he's feeling it going to 10 and, and ripping it. But anytime, whenever you have your dispersion left or right, like in our normal full swing, we should be working more in a vertical line because it's a lot more efficient and there's less time for interfering thoughts to come in. Mm -hmm. um, so one, there is a little structural change for that. Um, but short game, very similar. Um, if you're an N, I find less value on the landing zone uh, than mm -hmm. an S. 
I've found that a lot of ends struggle. They feel really restricted when the landing zone is too big of a priority for them. Uh, their brain wants to go all the way more to the end result. So if you're a person who likes to pick a landing zone as an end, I would just say see it rolling out like a putt from that area and finishing down by the hole. But same concept can apply. We can add a zone around the hole, allow our body to be feeling and responding to that target. And for an end, that's going to be really successful. For a sensor, same thing, just right over the intermediate spot with a lot of confidence executing mm -hmm. that move. Sensors tend to have a lot more they want to know the intermediate or landing spot um, and they're going to play more to a landing spot than an end. So that would be one like deviation. Mm, that's interesting. So intuitives, I would think that they would benefit more from the landing zone, but you're actually saying the opposite. Yes. And the reason is, is because when you look at how that intuitive mind works, it kind of appears on some of the, the research is like a Christmas tree looking thing. <laughs> it kind of spirals out like this. And the way I always thought about it was, is the end has to be to the hole. So the hole would be the star you're putting on top of the Christmas tree. So if I put the, the landing spot on the Christmas tree, now all the references my intuitive mind is looking to connect is to get it to that spot. Mm. But really not beyond it because ends are reverse engineers. We work with start at the end in mind and we work backwards. So we're kind of leaving it short. And I... <laughs> Believe it or not, I've seen so many ends, they focus on the landing spot, and that's where it ends, right? Mm -hmm. Like, um, yep, and so I'm definitely picturing a shot I hit yesterday, and because I always, yeah, definitely because I always think more landing zone. And, now, you and can I identify realize, but, that, but the yeah. thing is, is we have to realize that's only half of the journey that we mm -hmm. want it to go. And now, ends if, if it's a little bit off of that spot, would I care? No, because typically it's still going to find and result at near around the hole or around that target zone mm -hmm. for the sensors if they get too caught up in the end target which happens when they're in stress around the green trying to force an outcome trying to be too reactive to the target that can sometimes stress them out they are going to be better off bringing it back let me hit that landing spot from there it's going to be good and executing over a spot more in front of them they're going to feel a lot more in control staying to a concrete job and that can be something so simple everybody mm -hmm. it could just be brushed to ground right um and hey, if I do that right, it's going to land there and it's going to ultimately trickle out. So uh, uh, sensors would benefit more from uh, mechanical like swing, swing thoughts while during the round while intuitives would focus better on more like tempo or flow those kind of things is that if it was relating to a swing an intuitive yeah. if it ha if you're going to think of a swing it should be more motion based yeah. something i just feel like i hear that a lot from people like should i have swing thought should i not and well a swing thought sometimes has a lot of bad connotation um mm. so it's not there instructing yourself on how to do something. I do think if you're trying to work yourself through, even as a sensor, two is too many. That's why I say mm -hmm. like two thoughts are too many. When yeah. you look at this, this, the science in, in some of like the marksman stuff, which is really similar to like draw a gun, shoot real quick. Uh, you have a two second thing like a golf swing. The moment you have something like draw the gun, tilt your head. Okay. Mm -hmm. You've already slowed reaction time down by a half a second. So if you have a similar process, but you're just here and you're bringing it down, you go, okay, take away, now release. Well, it's happening too fast that those two thoughts are going to slow down the performance by at least a half second. Timing, rhythm, everything's going to get off. Sensors don't necessarily have to have a swing thought. If you're an ST type, it tends to be something like a concrete, maybe technical task, but it mm -hmm. doesn't have to be a technical task. If you're an SF, it might be more of a feel, like I'm going to feel my footwork or connect mm. with my feet or I'm going to feel the release of the club. Um, it's more of a concrete job that, hey, when I know I'm aimed and I do this one little simple thing, that always happens because golf isn't reactionary. We don't have opponents attempting to block us. We have no moving targets. There is absolutely nothing to react to. So as soon as you are established as a sensor on your target line, well, if I'm here and I execute my stock thing, I can't defy physics. The ball has to result there. It doesn't matter how much I'm looking at it. It's and, and most sensors aren't even doing that when they look at their practice, even in their short game. They probably have an alignment rod down, especially if they're a J. They know their aim properly. They forget about their target and they're just into their one move. That's actually what needs to be brought to the golf course as well. Mm. But two is too many. 
It could be a swing thought, but think of it more of like a concrete task, something you have a control of. Other aspects, like player side, target size mentality. So once we're starting to get into automation, like some of my pros, I have an auditory sensor. Sensors can engage your senses even as their job. His job at address isn't anything technical. It is to hear his breathing to the ball okay. to ensure he's doing his breath, his timing's good, and he's relaxing his brain and body. So for him, he wants to hear, that's his move. He knows if I'm aimed right and I do that, it's good. Interesting. Never thought about an auditory like that instead of just a mechanical. Or Some other, it, it yeah. could be feeling the grip of their club mm. and I'm going to engage the feel. Yeah, Jordan Spieth does that weird thing with his, with his thumb. I don't know if you've seen that right before he's hitting the ball. And I, it almost looks like he's moving it while he's swinging, but it's like that's his trigger. It, it could like be, it could be a kinesthetic be, yeah. type of thing, but uh -huh. even that could be a way of engaging in the moment, staying more player sided mm -hmm. because sensors are going to worry about outcomes. They're going to worry about where it's going, what's going to happen. If they're just into that simple thing, or, hey, I want to just watch the club head go through the ball. That would be another task. Mm -hmm. They're not consciously out at the target. And so they're in something simple, in control, and that's going to free them up to be able to make a motion. However, their backup would be, hey, one concrete task. Stress would be worrying about outcomes, what's going to happen, multiple shots, or having questions at address. <laughs> Same thing target side. Target side isn't, it could be a, a lot of different things. So it could be an end target, like a top golf, bringing the end target back, like how you like to do it. Able mm -hmm. to see the end goal and, hey, it's going to get there how it gets there, but it's going there. For me, I like seeing an apex window. I'm an extroverted intuitive. So I like seeing something that's almost halfway done and leaving my options open. And, hey, it can, once I get it to here, it can leak left, it can leak right. I'm going to be in my area. Um, it could be more of a launch window or a trajectory. Um, you could just bring the target back, but we're doing things to keep our mind engaging on that side of the line to get rid of the how to thoughts or the instructional thoughts about our golf swing. Um, I like to tell intuitives, just imagine you're even when you're looking at the ball, like you're looking out of your ear, keep yourself engaging like you're looking through your ear and then they keep their mind on their target and their body will res will react and respond in according fashion. Short game, same types of things. We had uh, uh, recently one of our players, she won conference. She was struggling her short game, extrovert intuitive. She had Scooby or one of her favorite cartoon characters holding hula hoops and hitting it through trajectories. Freed her up, activated creativity. Next thing you know, she's lining it up on two or three tournaments. Wow. Um, putting wise, you can bring that in, you know, put your favorite cartoon character, comic book character on the entry point, knock them into the hole. Great visual. Mm -hmm. Imagine I'm a Batman, like, you know, sitting on six o'clock and knock them in. That, that's helpful for intuitives, as creative as it is, but it's engaging that hole. Um, last thing about putting, and I don't mean to ramble, no, I encourage all every, of my... Everybody needs more help with the flat stick. <laughs> well, I just encourage, one, everybody should ask the question, where is the ball entering? Okay, that's a great question to ask. And you mean which like position in the cup, assuming it's like a like a clock system? Yeah, I like a clock. It's easy to do. Um, where's it entering? That's a great question because when you ask yourself that, what do you see in your mind? Mm -hmm. The ball entering the hole. All right. Yeah, so right. based on the general research, you have a positive picture. We have a thirty percent, close to thirty percent elevation in accuracy. You have a negative so when you're picture. Reading the putt, you think, "Hey, where's this going to enter?" So if it's a left to right putt, you're thinking of it going in more on the seven or eight o'clock. But you're already thinking, "Yes, it's going to go in," and here's why it's going to go in. So you're basically programming yourself for success. You already have a, a step forward. Yeah, mm, uh, I had an interesting conversation a number of years back with Dr. David Wright, and he said something really cool. He said, "At the Brain Imaging Center in San Antonio, Texas." They said that when you visualize, you're creating 80% of your neuro pathways needed to execute the task. So when you look wow. at that Henry Ford yeah. statement, whether you say you can or you can't, you're right. Why? Because that picture or what we're starting with is 80% of the task. That's, that's a startling number. Okay, so where is it entering? Well, boom, good. We got a picture right off the bat. I mean, that's good for sensors and intuitives. Where do I see the ball going in?
Mm -hmm. Good. We got a positive picture. Once we've identified that, there's a number of ways you can read the greens. Sensors tend to be really linear. They're probably going to be really drawn towards aim point, systems like that, because it gives them a little bit more of a linear route to be able to determine breaks and lines. Um, but I like to have everybody reverse visualize when they're putting. Um, not going forward, because again, we can visualize forward, but seeing a miss left, right, short, long, all different ways. And again, they did studies where they instructed players to do that, just to intentionally visualize wrong. And they <laughs> dropped their accuracy by a lot. It was, yeah. it was pretty startling. I'm um, just laughing because I can see how the mind can go that way. So it's like when you reverse visualize, you're imagining it, you're pulling it out of the cup, basically, and pulling it back to your putter. Correct. So let's assume it's just like at the six o'clock, the intuitives, get your eyes up, see it rolling up the side, over six, back down your line. And mm -hmm. we incorporate this with the breathing process. It gets really fun and easy. So we take a deep breath in, see the hole. We're breathing it down the line. Now we're at our ball. Our breath is finishing. We're settled. We're relaxed. And we're just sending it basically back down the line but we're ensuring with the reverse visualizing that you're putting that positive image in your mind and for every player that's going to be a boost now there are some nuances so if you're an intuitive right what's going to be take you more player side and precise is if you're trying to use like a chalk line mm -hmm. a little tiny spot in the back of the hole uh, where we're again like with targeting trying to be really specific and narrow that's going to make you tight and have to micromanage your putting stroke and everything so let's just keep it simple it's going in at six o'clock i tell my intuitives now set your gate seven and five and almost like as wide as a toilet paper roll mm. you could be envisioning your line as an n okay because it's really about speed speed's going to determine a lot of it falling in um right on, on that anyway so the way i imagine it is is like a blacktop road michael the yellow dotted line in the middle is going into the heart if i could keep it on that dotted line it's for sure in however if i can keep it on the road with the right speed i have a really good shot of holding the putt and that gives a lot of freedom to be bringing that that big road back and just keep it on the road and now we still have some variance and we're not so rigid to have to guide and, and manage our putting stroke. Yeah, that was big for me. It's like when you think about like a lot of people, like you said, want to think about the smallest part of it going in or you're looking at that small part of grass like in the back of the cup. But it's like that wasn't great for me. So it's like, like you said, either six o'clock would be great for sensors. Like that's something like very concrete. Like a chalk for, line, yeah. Yeah, but like a chalk line. Like I hated using chalk lines. Like I, I, it just felt restricted. Like the... The putting tutor, a great thing, but I felt too restricted because there's little marbles on each side of it and I like would do it. But when I use a putting mirror, it's like a little more freeing. I kind of have that ability. So that just goes to show even with like putting though, it can make such a big difference by your mental golf type. Because if you're thinking small, 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 but you're an intuitive, you're actually like just stressed out before you even hit the putt. So I'm just glad you brought that up about putting too, specifically. Does the short game routine stay the same as far as second wise? Does it need to be that eight second rule? Uh, Cause I feel like how many times- It tends to be a little you... quicker. Um, obviously oh, okay. because um, some of the swings quicker. So you have yeah. a little less time just from like the full swing to impact. Cause I just imagine the everyday golfer when they have that putt they want to make, it's eight, 10, 12 seconds are over it. And as this. Uh, I've, I've found that that tends to be a little bit more efficient. Um, that's why the breathing yeah. process is so key. So mm -hmm. what, if you're if you're one of those people who are dragging on, it definitely is only going to invoke more activity. I tell mm -hmm. people if you pick your target, you prepared, and you know what you want to execute, what's Just left go. to really think about that's yeah. going to benefit your performance. People don't realize top performers they strip everything down to only what is necessary for excellence, and then everything else is considered fluff. <laughs> Right. And so we really have to to strip a lot of that out in order to elevate our consistency and, and bring as minimal into that shot process as possible. If you're, if you're struggling with the slow play or like staying over the ball too much and, and all it's going to do is invoke those mental demons, you really want to employ a breathing process. Your breathing is the way you track your timing on the course and create consistency, because I'm not sure if there's a magical second number. Okay, but there is a correlation between being long 
off your average and being slightly better than your average as far as a correlation between good shots and bad shots. Bad ones are always a little longer and you're, you, it drags on. Use your breath. So get used to, if you're a righty, once you set your, le- your right foot in, you're getting square, now's the time to start breathing. So you're going to breathe in deeply through your nose. If you're an intuitive, engage the target. If you're a sensor, check the target, get the eyes more back at the ball. And then do that full breath. Because if your breath is there, once that finishes, that's the go trigger. We're relaxing our brain. We're loosening all the tension in the body. And there's like this moment of presence after you get good at it that that's the performance window. Mm -hmm. And if you can't take your swing back then, right, you're not ready. There's only one necessary thing you do. You have to back out and get the necessary data points that you need in order to feel committed and confident. But that's the way that you can eliminate that, build a lot of consistency in your timing, and really put yourself in a great position to succeed with the shot is the breathing. Love that. Yeah, that that makes a ton of sense, the breathing as the trigger. I feel like slow play has been a very big topic in the golf world after the Masters. Patrick Cantlay is getting grilled on that. I saw Patrick just swooped up Tiger's caddy, Joe LaCava, today. Uh, I'm curious, do you think that, like, it, would that help him play better if he didn't take 45 seconds standing over the golf ball sometimes? Because it is, it's painful to watch. Obviously, it leads to slow golf, but I just read a great Arcos golf study, and they, they studied, I mean, millions of shots, and they based it on basically a, a, after about three and a half hours, uh, the players shot about ha- about a half shot worse each round. So if you're like, taking four and a half or five hours, you're like a shot or shot and a half higher. Um, is that something you think could help him or other golfers out there? I just can't imagine st- – playing five and a half hours for two two guys is helping him that's a fascinating stat i never realized that it kind of really sheds a lot of light too on q school when you're on a q school for like five and a half hour rounds mm-hmm. and things as well that's that's fascinating um my opinion is as i yeah i think a hundred percent uh everybody can improve by creating better consistency and Again, it would be, I think he could be a lot more efficient over the ball. I can't imagine what could be going on inside that would be benefiting his performance at that point. That couldn't be a lot more efficient. Um, doesn't mean that he has to go from 40 seconds down to eight. Um, but if I do think like, hey, you're always going to be better. There's a correlation be- with that shot clock and having less time there and being decisive. It makes you get committed. It makes you get clear. And then when you have a trigger like that, I think that would benefit him so that he knows mm-hmm. now is the time to go. And if not, I want to get out of that box because I don't want to be programming my performance zone to be a thinking space. Mm. I want that, again, to be a space that has as minimal as possible that will deliver excellence. And so the more – and that's why I don't like a lot of rehearsal swings next to the ball because you're literally conditioning that space to be a preparation zone rather than a place that you can perform. Uh, it's called spatial anchoring. It's a term they talk about in neurolinguistic programming. Uh, guys like Tony Robbins do this stuff all the time in their crowds. They do spatial anchoring. Tony will walk over to 1X on the stage and he'll get everybody fired up. Yeah, 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 all the positive things over here. Then he'll walk over here and start implying seeds of doubt or the negative stuff or the things that are uncomfortable. And I, I mean, I'm not calling out Tony. I'm just and, no, that's uh, fascinating. Yeah. And then whenever they're going to go do their 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 pitch for their weekend, they walk over here onto the positive spot wow. that they condition the whole time. And then suddenly people wonder why, like, they're really drawn towards it. If he pitched it from the other spot. Everybody, nobody would show up for the weekend, right? Attorneys do this too. Like they can use a spot to create doubt. So anytime they're talking about seeds of doubt in the case, they're going to do it here. When they're talking about their supporting stuff, they're going to do it here. They're going to work their jury, condition them. And then when it's time for them to be believable, they go stand on that spatial anchor. Okay. Wow. This, our minds do this all the time. I mean, just look at our normal behaviors. If uh, someone smokes, they, they create a spatial anchor, let's say, to a car. Mm-hmm. And so these things are happening, and especially if we're struggling in practice, we're next to the ball, what am I doing? And we're, we're obsessing over it. Pretty soon that can become a trained thinking space. And that's why we would maybe do rehearsals, and we want to just preserve that space. We want to be in, be decisive, be an athlete, and then 
perform. Um, mm-hmm. So that's I think everybody yeah, could benefit. Facial anchoring, I've never heard of that. That's fascinating. And I've been to a Tony Robbins thing, and I can totally understand that now. <laughs> and <too>. his weekend. <laughs> and his weekend. <laughs> right. Yep, exactly. <laughs> wow. All right. Well, before we let you go, I wanted to do um, introducing a new segment to the show, just doing a little rapid-fire Q&A. I know we're going to have a Taco Bell question in here after our earlier talk. Uh, but just a few little things uh, just to get – uh, your take on them, and then uh, we will wind it down. So I'm curious, um, what should golfers do to break a slump? I've talked to a lot of golfers lately, and they're like coming out of a you know cold winter, or they're finally getting back into it, and they just feel like they're slumping. What's your easiest way to hopefully solve that? Get your MGT figured out. <laughs> Make sure you're not in stress. Mm-hmm. All right. Um, what is the best or example that you've seen or watch on TV of either PGA or live guys that actually go through their own mental golf type and really just dial it in? I mean, I think Tiger for a long time um, was the king. You could see predictably when he struggled, um, when he was in between those two modes on what to do and he was struggling, but um, Tiger's figured himself out. And for the majority of his golf career, I mean, he has just been to the T to his type. Justin Rose is a great example. You see how methodical and regimented he is. He somehow knows himself. He's such a cool, calm character out there. I think he's a great ISTJ model. Um, and, and you look at Phil. I mean, all, all the people who've reached tour, just they've all learned them. They're not the guys looking around down the range going, I want to be like that guy. Mm-hmm. Everybody's looking at them because they have learned themselves. They, they've they gone through these processes with a lot of coaching and experiences and, and, and their own insights to determine what they need to do to be their best. Uh, and, of course, Bubba. I just love Bubba doing his MGT thing because Bubba, true to their type, ENTP, he invented his own way. He kind of he's his, walks to his own drum beat. I mean, he plays Bubba golf, and when that guy is embracing who he is, it's exciting to watch. Watch what he does. I, I'm not sure if that answers the question, but no, it does. Um, Absolutely, I, you know, I like those. I know guys. there's a lot of lot of different examples out there. I figured Tiger would have to be up there just because. Oh, he, and don't forget DJ. Get... You know, he's yeah. one of my favorite ends as well. They say DJ, how do you hit a fade? He goes, okay, you aim left. And most importantly, you fade it. <laughs> That's DJ. picture. There is no how yep. to. That's picture driven. Allow the athleticism to take yep. over. I just love that um, from that context. I mean, spoken like a perfect end. You know, DJ is a golf <laughs> treasure. I mean, he really is. He is so fun to watch. And actually, that leads me to my next question: How do you get over bad shots quickly? I know DJ has that goldfish memory. Uh, how do people do it? Because I know that one bad shot can easily lead to another and another and another. Well, one is is developing actually some systems to do that. We have some of those things listed in, in mental golf type. But when in doubt, just remember, forgive yourself. Um, that is the best thing. If you're really, really struggling post shot, take it to forgiveness. Oftentimes, it's really learning what your personality type is to know what's the right way to be evaluating things. So if you're a feeler and you have an F on your results... The most important thing in your post shot, you have to remain supportive and you have to look for good things to build upon, okay? If you're looking as an F, you're looking at wrong and what I got to fix, you're using the wrong evaluation function in your mind and that's going to make you get critical, take you into stress and your game will derail. We can evaluate things, even errors as a feeler by saying, hey, what did I do good and what do I want to improve? Now we're in a building mentality. We're remaining supportive. And for feelers, attitude is above all. It has to be there. If the attitude goes, the game's going to go. Thinker, a thinker has got to get rid of the emotional cloud that they put down or the frustrations. And we got to look for feedback. Thinkers are fixers by nature. They are hardwired designed to look impersonally at things, say, hey, that needs corrected, and I'm the one to step in and do that. Those adjustments on the course for a thinker can be really easy when you're staying level-headed and you're keeping things objective, meaning, hey, a golf shot isn't a personal thing. I should look at it like a math problem or a science experiment type of thing, physics thing. Because if I can just look for my feedback, use my level-headedness and my logic, I'll have a simple fix, and that's not a problem for me. I'll fix it and move forward. So feeler, be a builder, 
Work on being supportive. If you're a thinker, get good feedback and make the simple adjustments. It's usually very simple. Uh, but if you have your emotions clouding, it's going to be hard to get there. That's why it's tough. If you're a feeler and you've got too much analysis going on, you're not going to get there. And that's when it's going to get tough. Should golfers uh, line, create a line on their golf ball for putting? <laughs> Good question. Um, I, I Generally speaking, I mean, it depends on what the purpose is. It has to have a purpose, first off. Um, but I'll just say Mike Bender did a little interesting experiment at his range one day where he put the aim board down behind the hole, had people line up their putt, and then check it with a laser. Okay, Most people, even with shorter putts, aimed wrong for mm -hmm. one uh, and he I, I forget what the study was but he had shared with me that there was a statistical thing that shows like outside of 10 or 12 feet the line becomes less relevant um, and especially it's all assuming that you're aiming that line correctly assuming you're aiming it correctly I think it's really good for a sensor it can help you with your alignment kind of stay more on the ball a little bit more into rolling it over the spot or matching up the line for an N, I think it can be really detrimental. I think it takes away your your subconscious and your feel, kind of allowing your eyes to adjust to things and to your target. Um, and then we tend to get too kind of married to that line that if it doesn't match up, you kind of get more player side or you're at that critical point where you go, well, it's off and I know that's <laughs> off. Should I back off? Should I roll this? Well, if I back off, these guys are going to think I'm taking forever. And, oh, my gosh, I'm just going to roll it anyways. And we roll it. We go, why didn't I back off the ball? Um, yep. So my one thing is, is if you're a player, this is all I tell you. If you're more comfortable with the line, I would just say as you set your ball, okay, I think there's two checkpoints. One, you're setting it behind the ball, and you're down on the ground, you're getting it level, and it looks good. Before you pick up your ball mark, stand up. Put your right foot in if you're a righty. Set that club head down and just give it a look down the line because that perspective is going to be a lot different. Now, if you give that checkpoint, great. Pick up your marker. Complete the rest of your shot process at that point for your putt because you know when you get to that, that point of view, it still sits. So those are my two checkpoints. It got a little good here and then down the line. Then you know we're not going to have those question marks whenever we set up to the ball. God, I just made that mistake so long before I figured out MGT too. I would just, yeah, everyone else told me to line it up, so I'll line it up. And then there's nothing worse than standing over the golf ball and be like, this isn't right. But I've already changed it. I'm taking too long. You're just never going to hit a good putt. And, uh, yeah, when you really do figure out, like, that it the line doesn't matter as much as we think. It's really more about speed and, and that toilet paper drill you talked about. And for the last question, of course, what is our favorite go-to item at Taco Bell? Oh, I got a lot. I don't know if I have a favorite go-to. I'll give you my top three. Cheesy Gordita, Crunch, Mexican Pizza, and a Crunch Wrap Supreme. Man, two of three with me right there. So we, we can we can. No sauce or sour cream, though. That's my requirement. Whoa. Yeah, I don't, I do don't do sour cream. That. I don't do sour what cream. What about the sauce? Oh, I, I mean, I'll do fire sauce. I'm talking about like what they oh. would actually put on to the taco okay. or the gordita. I okay. don't do ranch. Just keep it, keep it clean then. Yeah, I don't do ranch. Don't do sour cream. Um, you don't even want to see like a whole cabinet in my refrigerator. It's just condiments then. <laughs> I mean, I like ketchup and stuff. But no, I don't like it on my tacos, but I'll, I'll layer it up with the fire. I'm definitely uh, okay. on the fire. And a del taco, <laughs> it's, it's del scorcho. I mean, that's, okay. that's the go-to. You got it. Well, John, thank you again, man, uh, for being a guest uh, on the podcast twice and just sharing all this knowledge. Uh, the more I talk to you, the more I realize I know very little about the mind. And I think I know a lot. So, you know, I, we appreciate all the work you've put in, all the research and to share it with everyone else. And uh, we're just wishing for the best for mental golf type to keep growing around the world and uh, help more players master the mental side of things. Yeah, hey, I really appreciate the opportunity. And uh, thanks for having me on again.